Hey guys, I am Danny, and welcome here to Summer Sky Gardens. So if you're new to my channel, I own a flower farm in Splendora, Texas, which is right northeast of Houston. So we're pretty south. And I am here today at the farm. It's raining, so I thought it would be a good chance to start thinking about planning and discussing our summer uh, flower farm plans. And I wanted to share with you my top flowers that do really well in our hot, hot, hot summer climate. I feel like you hear a lot about summer annuals and flowers to grow throughout the summer and the fall, but not a lot of people, I feel like, share about gardening in a super hot or humid climate like where I live. So if you're used to the USDA zones, I'm zone 9B, although I will tell you that the zoning only tells you about how cold it gets, not about how hot it gets. But to give you an idea, last summer we had temperatures in the hundreds for almost three months. Uh, some days it was up to 110 uh, or higher with the heat index. We usually have a pretty high humidity and very little rain. Um, and the hot temperatures will start creeping in. I mean, we'll definitely be getting up in the 90s by May. And then, you know, June, it's fairly hot. Uh, July, August, and September are the worst. Probably August is, is the ultimate worst. <laughs> um, so in general, I mean, at that point in the year, you may struggle some to grow things. But these flowers that I'm going to share with you, I have grown successfully for years throughout the whole summer and into the fall and they will continue on until we get our first frost which this past year was in uh, later December. So I had sunflowers and zinnias and different things that were still blooming into December but all these flowers can take the heat, they can take the humidity, there are a few issues here and there which I will give you some tips on how to deal with those and how to grow them. So. Um, let's get started. The six flowers that I'm going to discuss are sunflowers, zinnias, basil, amaranth, celosia, and gomphrena. All right, so let's talk about sunflowers. And throughout this video, I'm going to be putting some uh, pictures or video up so you can see what I'm talking about or some things that I've grown. And in my next few videos, I'm going to talk about specific varieties. I'm going to do a whole video about sunflower varieties and a whole video about zinnia varieties just because I've grown so many different types. A lot of them are great. Some of them are crappy. So maybe that'll help you in planning out your summer uh, flowers and it'll save you from buying seed that you're not really going to enjoy. Okay, so sunflowers um, in general, great summer and fall crop. You're going to want to ideally direct sow. So that means plant the seeds directly out in the field. Now, there is a caveat to this that I learned last year. When the temperatures outside get really above 100 degrees and your soil temperature gets too hot, they are not going to germinate um, or you're, it, it's going to be a huge struggle. And I wasted a lot of seed before I really realized that. I also struggled with watering them once I was directly sowing them in the heat. So what I did is I started them indoors, which they germinated great, and I was able to transplant them just fine. I did find that the ones that I started inside were a little shorter and smaller. Now, I don't know if that's always the case or that was just the case for me last year. The ones that were direct sown that were able to germinate and grow, they were a lot bigger and taller. So I think that that's something to just keep in mind. It's definitely doable if you need to start them inside in the heat and then transfer them. That is a way to get them growing when it's that hot outside. Um, but if you can direct sow them, then that's really the ideal way to go. Um, a lot of the sunflower varieties, especially the pro cuts, which are really nice for cutting and arranging, they will grow, especially in the heat, as soon as like 40 days. <laughs> Um, on the packet, it'll say maybe like 50 to 60 days, but if it's hot outside, they like the heat and they will grow and bloom a lot faster. So that's something to keep in mind when you're kind of planning out your production. 
So this past year in our UPIC field, I grew a lot of the singles and I grew a lot of the branching varieties. Um, I didn't really see too much difference with how they all handled the heat. So I think, you know, just in the consideration of the climate and the weather, you know, whatever variety you want to grow should be fine. Like I said, a future video, I'll discuss the different varieties and some of the, the pros and cons of different ones. So as far as watering, I found that the sunflowers, they could go a couple of days without water as long as you gave them like a really deep drink, probably every two to three days when the temperatures were getting into the hundreds. They didn't necessarily need water every day. They could handle like a little bit of drought, but you really had to hit them pretty good every few days. Um, mine did not... Um, they did not have a ton of bug pressure. I mean, I found a little bit of caterpillar um, nibbling probably from white flies here and there. But overall, the bugs were not really an issue with my sunflowers. But there's definitely some products that you could spray if you start to see that. I will say with harvesting sunflowers, you want to catch them when they're like just barely starting to open. You can see the little colorful petals inside. I'll, I'll put a picture right here. Um, just as they're barely opening, that's when you want to cut them and get them inside to um, hold on to them. Now, they can handle up to about a week in the cooler, especially if they're cut pretty tight. But that way, you get them before the bugs can really get in and damage them, before the bees can get in and mess with the pollen, which will make them turn to seed. So ideally, that's the, the time to harvest them. But sunflowers overall are one of the top summer flowers and fall flowers, especially if you're going to be running a U-pick field, they do great just selling them in straight bunches. People love all the different colors. So, you know, if you if you're growing a flower garden or you have a flower farm for the summer and the fall, you definitely want to add in sunflowers. All right. So the next flower is probably my favorite, and it's usually really high on most people's lists, and that are that is zinnias. So zinnias are like the workhorse, quintessential, you know, summer flower, especially for those of us here in the South. They like the heat. They do not like colder temperatures. I will say this past year, I had some flowers that actually handled some frost and grew a lot later than I thought. But zinnias, as soon as we got our first frost, they were all toast. So my recommendation, I know people that direct sow them and they will grow, but you want to wait for that um, until the soil temperatures are a lot warmer. So how I kind of get a head start on the season is I start them inside. They're very easy to start inside. And then after about four to five weeks, I transplant them outside. So they have that kind of kickstart growing in. And then once it gets warmer outside, all your frost is done. You can then transplant them. Now, I have found once the heat of the summer sets in, zinnias do want a little bit more water. So I was out there watering them every day, maybe every other day. But if you can really get them a good drink of water every day, that will definitely help them uh, looking their best when the temperatures are getting that hot. Now, a big issue that I dealt with last summer with our horrible, you know, temps was a lot of bug pressure on the zinnias. So there's a couple of things you can do to combat this. And I will say the biggest bug that I see to have an issue with uh, where I live is like white fly caterpillar damage. And you'll see it happens very quickly. You'll go out and you'll see chewing on the, um, the leaves and the petals and your flowers start to look really deformed. If you catch it early, you can start to spray every couple of weeks with a um, uh, Captain Jack's dead bug solution. So that's an organic product that has spinosad in it and it kills all caterpillars. So if you let it get out of control, it's really hard to combat it with the chemical product. But if you catch it early, it will kind of nip them in the bud. But you're going to want to repeat it probably after a couple of weeks. Now, as well with the heat and the humidity, zinnias will succumb to powdery mildew, which is like a white film on the leaves and the flowers or black spot. 
Um, I have not found that to be a big enough issue on the flowers in order to do anything about it. And one of my tips for combating this is succession plant. So every month I'm trying to put out a new crop of zinnias. Not that the previous crop is done for necessarily, but they will start to show some disease. And so by the time they are petering out, the next succession looks great. It's blooming. I'm not having to go spend all this time and money and energy treating the old crop. I just yank it out and I start harvesting from the new one. So in that sense, zinnias are a really great flower to succession plant in order to combat disease and kind of minimize how much time and effort you're spending on that. Now when harvesting, try to get them either early in the morning or in the evening, you know, when it's a little bit cooler, make sure when you cut them that you do the wiggle tests, which a lot of us know by now, the stem, you want to grab it and kind of move it back and forth. If the flower stays pretty stiff, it's good to go. But if you wiggle it and the flowers kind of do in this business, it's not ready yet. And uh, zinnias do not like the cooler. So once you get them in water, just bring them inside you know, a basic cool, dark place in your home. But if you put them in the cooler, they are going to get really angry. <laughs> so um, they're one of the top flowers to not put in the cooler. Really zinnias and basil are probably the only ones that cannot handle the cooler. I will say for myself, especially like last year, I didn't have a cooler. This year I uh, will. Um, I had like a couple of refrigerators that I could use, but my summer flowers, I didn't put anything in the refrigerator. So to me, it's really not that big of a deal. It's more of an issue with spring flowers. Summer flowers, they like the heat. So, you know, they should be able to do just fine being in like a cool, dark area in your house until you're ready to use them. Okay, the next flower is actually an herb and that's basil. Now, a lot of us in hotter environments or for the summer use basil as a greenery. It's really nice when it flowers up. Um, some of the better varieties, Mrs. Burns Lemon has like a whitish flower and then the cinnamon basil has a purple flower. So depending on what colors of other flowers you're growing, it can be a really great way to add in greenery. It has a really nice herbal smell. You know, a lot of the summer flowers don't have smell. And so when you're selling, you know, maybe a mixed bouquet, one of the first things people do when they go pick up a bouquet is, is smell it. Um, the basil will kind of add in just a nice herbal smell that most people tend to appreciate. Now I find basil in the heat of the summer to kind of be similar to sunflowers. It can handle a day or two without water as long as you give it a really good deep drink. Um, so just think kind of every two to three days you should be out watering it. I did not really have a lot of bug pressure on my basil. So, you know, once again, I think if anything's going to hit it, it's going to be something like caterpillar damage. So use Captain Jack's dead bug spray. But for me, I did not have any issues and it's pretty disease, um, disease resistant as well. Now, a huge issue with basil is wilting. So there's a couple of things you can do to combat this. And I've heard people say they don't grow it because every time they cut it, it just wilts and dies. But if you do these couple of things, it will be a huge game changer for you. So number one, cut it like really early in the morning. As soon as you can get out there, even before the sun comes up, go out and cut it. Make sure you're only cutting basil that is nice and woody. So the stems are like really tough um, and it's already flowering. That's when you want to cut the basil. If you cut it too young, like when the stems are not quite as like thick and tough, it will wilt on you and you won't be able to use it. Now, if you don't want the flowers on it, just cut it with the flower and rip the flower off. I've done that plenty of times, but you need to make sure it's like nice and thick and woody. Cut it early in the morning and then put it inside in water for at least 24 hours. So this is one of those like you don't want to cut the morning of an event or a delivery. You want to get it the day before and give it plenty of time to drink up water so that it's nice and hydrated. Now, one tip you can do if you find that your basil is still wilty, if you cut it early, if you're letting it hydrate, is you can use a solution called Quick Dip. 
So this really allows the plant to take up a lot of water really quickly. So take your basil out of the bucket, put some fresh water in there for when you're done, give it a fresh trim on the stem and dip it really quick, a few seconds in the quick dip solution and then put it back in the water. I have done this before and within an hour basil that was like super floppy and dead looking was nice, straight up bushy and fully hydrated. All right, the next one that I'm gonna talk about is amaranth. Now amaranth is a great filler flower. You can get ones that tend to stay, the flowers tend to stay more upright or ones that will kind of droop down, which can be a really pretty addition, especially for event work. There's a lot of different colors. Um, I think the prettier ones are like the gold amaranth or the, which is like the hot biscuits or the purpley velvet curtains amaranth but it's kind of whatever you want to do. I think that it's very versatile and goes with a lot of different stuff. And it has that cool textural element that a lot of people find really interesting in mixed bouquets. So I have found amaranth to be one of those flowers that is probably one of the hardier ones for the summer. Um, I did not see the heat or lack of water affect it. I was watering it every few days and it did just fine. The issue I had with amaranth was definitely bug damage. Um, the caterpillars got out of control. I got on it way too late. And so I didn't have a lot of usable stems this last year. So that is definitely something to keep um, on tab is, you know, if you start to see a little bit of damage on the leaves, get in there, get spraying, you know, get rid of um, those caterpillars early or they will just decimate your plants. Amaranth, you can kind of cut at any stage when it's small, when it's big, um, and it's great for drying. Um, most people, when they bring it inside to dry, will stand it upright and let it kind of flop to use it. You can also hang it upside down. One quick note on amaranth is plant them closer together than what's recommended. I think some of the seed packets will say, oh, you know, you can plant it like 12 inches, 9 inches apart. That will get you giant plants. I had one last year that had just reseeded and threw out this random seedling and it probably got to be eight feet tall. Um, the huge flower head was like this big. Um, I thought it was cool. I didn't use it other than I cut it off and I hung it upside down to dry and it looks like a huge like broom. <laughs> the handle or the uh, the stem looks like a handle and the bottom looks like a broomstick. So it's a cool decorative piece, but entirely not usable for, you know, cut flower bouquets. So space them closer together. I would say between six to nine inches. That will get you a more manageable, smaller plant. All right. The next one is celosia and kind of like amaranth, celosia provides a lot of textural uh, interest to bouquets. It does great in the heat, of course, and it does great drying. Um, one thing that I found with the Celosia is the darker or more vibrant varieties grew better and looked better. Uh, the pastel ones that I have tried in the heat of the summer just looked really faded and dirty and not just usable in my opinion. So. I'm not growing those anymore. I'm only going to grow the ones that are like darker colors, vibrant colors, like the hot pink, the bright orange. I mean, I think those are totally fun to add in with a lot of these summer flowers. Celosia with watering, it's kind of along the lines of amaranth as well, like every couple of days and it does pretty good. Um, maybe even up to three days, as long as you give it a really deep watering. Um, one note, when it does start to flower, make sure you harvest it before it starts setting seed or else when you bring it inside, if you like shake it or hit something, all those little black seeds are just going to fall and get everywhere, uh, which is great if you want to save seed, but it's not great if you're trying to use it, um, in a bouquet. So make sure you cut it before it's setting seed. And especially outside, if you let it go to seed, it will reseed everywhere. Like I've had it growing in cracks in the concrete, in brick, um, all over the garden. So, you know, be careful with where you grow it and just know that if you're not catching it early enough, it will 
throw seed and start growing everywhere. And then the last flower that I wanted to talk about is gomfrina. Now I know gomfrina can be kind of like a love or hate relationship. Like everybody likes how it looks and how it, you know, works in a bouquet and it's kind of like dancing whimsical has these little pom pom flowers, but it can be a huge pain to harvest. So a lot of people in the flower farming world have recommended like go in and grab like a bunch of stems and just chop it, sickle it, cut like a massive bunch and then bunch that and use that. Um, if you go in and you try to cut like individual stems, it is going to take forever. So if you want to use it, the full stem in like a, a bouquet or an arrangement, just go cut like a big chunk of it and throw it in water. Now, one thing that I love about Gomfrina is it dries beautifully. I mean, the flowers look just like they do when they're alive. They do dry. Um, and the brighter colors are the ones that are going to dry best. And I think if you tear off the little pom-pom flowers, those are super fun to use in Christmas ornaments or on flower pumpkins or any kind of decorative work. Um, just kind of putting them in different places. I think they're so fun to use. So Gomfrina, I usually start inside. It can be direct seeded, but I like to just start it inside and just know with your planning, a little bit goes a long way. One plant will form like this huge bush of flowers. So you definitely don't need like a 50 foot row of Gomfrina. Um, you know, a handful of plants, maybe like 10, 20 feet would probably be plenty for most people. Okay, so there you have it. That's my top six flowers that can take the heat all summer in your cut flower garden or your flower farm. Comment below if you have any questions. Uh, make sure you give this video a like and a follow. Do all the things for the algorithm. And I will see you in my next video.